Everyone who has travelled over eastern England knows it's studded with fine country houses, the sort with parks of 80, 100 acres. I have to tell you of a curious series of events which happened in such a house. It is Castringham Hall in Suffolk. Italian portico, square block of White House, older inside than out, park with fringe of woods and lake. The one feature that marked out the house from a score of others is gone. As you looked at it from the park, you saw on the right a great old ash tree growing within half a dozen yards of the wall. It had more or less attained its full dimensions by the year 1690. In that year, the district in which the hall was situated uh, was the scene of a number of witch trials. Whether the persons accused of this offence really did imagine that they were possessed of unusual powers of any kind, or whether they had the will, at least, if not the power, of doing mischief to their neighbours, or whether all the confessions, of which there are so many, came about because the witch finders had such cruel ways and means, these are questions which are not, I fancy, yet solved. Castringham, too, contributed a victim to the witch-hunting hysteria. Mrs. Mothersoul was her name, and she differed from the ordinary run of village witches only in being rather better off and in a more influential position. Efforts were made to save her by several reputable farmers of the parish. They did their best to testify to her character and were anxious what the verdict of the jury would be. What seems to have been fatal to the woman was the evidence of the then proprietor of Castingham Hall, Sir Matthew Fell. He testified to having watched her on three different occasions from his window at a full moon, gathering sprigs from the ash tree near his house. She climbed into the branches clad only in her shift and was cutting off small twigs with a peculiarly curved knife. And as she did so, she seemed to be talking to herself. On each occasion, Sir Matthew had done his best to capture the woman, but she'd always taken alarm at some accidental noise he had made and all he could see when he got down to the garden was a hare running across the park in the direction of the village. Mainly on this evidence of Sir Matthew's, though there was much more of a less striking and unusual kind from other parishioners, Mrs. Mother's soul was found guilty and condemned to die. She was hanged a week after the trial with five or six more unhappy creatures at Bury St. Edmunds. Sir Matthew Fell, then Deputy Sheriff, was present at the execution. It was a damp, drizzly March morning when the cart made its way up the rough grass hill outside Northgate where the gallows stood. The other victims gave up hope. They were broken down with misery. But Mrs. Mothersoul was, as in life, so in death of a very different temper. Her poisonous rage, as a reporter of the time puts it, did so work upon the bystanders, even upon the hangman, that it was said by all that saw her that she seemed to turn into a mad devil before their very eyes. Yet she offered no resistance to the officers of the law, but for those who laid hands on her, she had such fury and spite in her face, as one of them told me afterwards. The very memory of it preyed upon his mind for the next six months. However, all that she is reported to have said were the seemingly meaningless words, which she repeated more than once in an undertone. There will be guests at the hall. Sir Matthew Fell was impressed by the bearing of the woman. He had some talk upon the matter with the vicar of the parish with whom he travelled home after the trial business was over. The whole episode had been repugnant to him, he said, for he was a man who liked to be on 
pleasant terms with those about him, but he saw a duty to be done in this business, and he had done it and given his evidence. A few weeks after, when the moon of May was high, Vicar and Squire met again in the park and walked to the hall together. Lady Phil was with her mother, who was dangerously ill, and Sir Matthew was alone at home. So the vicar, Mr. Crome, was easily persuaded to, to take a late supper at the hall. When Mr. Crome thought of starting for home about half past nine, Sir Matthew and he took a turn on the gravelled walk at the back of the house. They were in sight of the ash tree, which I described as growing near the windows of the building, when Sir Matthew stopped and said, What is that running up and down the stem of the ash? It's never a squirrel, is it? They will be in their nests by now. The vicar looked and saw the moving creature, but he could make nothing of its colour in the moonlight. The sharp outline, however, seen for an instant, was imprinted on his brain and could have sworn, he said, though it sounded foolish, as squirrel or not, it had more than four legs. Next day, Sir Matthew fell had failed to appear downstairs by his usual six o'clock. Seven o'clock passed, eight o'clock. The servants went and knocked on his bedroom door. The door was opened at last from the outside, and they found their master dead and black. There were no obvious marks of violence. But the window was open. One of the men went to fetch the parson and then, by his directions, rode on to give notice to the coroner. Mr. Crome himself went as quickly as he could to the hall and was shown to the room where the dead man lay. Mr. Crome has left some notes among his papers which show how genuine a respect and sorrow was felt for Sir Matthew. This uh, passage throws some light on the course of events and illustrates the common beliefs of the time. There wasn't any sign of forced entry to the bedroom, but the window was open, as my poor friend always would have it at this time of year. He had his evening drink of ale in a silver vessel, a pint measure, but tonight he hadn't drunk it. This drink was examined by the physician from Bury St. Edmunds, a Mr. Hodgkins. On oath, he declared that he couldn't detect any substances of a venomous kind, but as was natural because the corpse was so swollen and black, there was talk among the neighbors of poison. The body was very pulled about as it lay in the bed, so twisted was it that my friend and patron must have died in great pain and agony. And what is still unexplained, and to me, argues the devil's work by those responsible for such a barbaric murder, was this, that the women entrusted with the laying out of the corpse and washing it, being both of them sober individuals and very well respected in their mournful profession, they came to me greatly distressed in mind and body, saying, and we had the proof of it, that they had no sooner touched the corpse with their bare hands than they felt a particularly violent shock and aching in their palms. Their forearms became so swollen and the pain so continuous that for many weeks they were forced to give up their job. but there were still no marks on the skin. I sent for the physician who was still in the house, and we made as careful a study as we were able, using a small magnifying lens of crystal on the condition of the skin on this part of the body, but we couldn't detect with the instrument anything significant beyond a couple of small punctures or pricks, which we then concluded were the spots where the poison might have been 
introduced. So much for the symptoms seen on the corpse. As to what follows, it is merely my own conjecture, and I'll leave it to posterity to judge whether it offers any valuable insight. On the table by the bedside, there was a small Bible, which my friend read from nightly, and on rising from his bed. As I took it up in my hands, it occurred to me to try out that old and to many superstitious practice of drawing the sorts. I opened the Bible at random three times, placing my finger on certain words. The first words were, cut it down. And the second time, it shall never be inhabited. And the third, her young ones also suck up blood. Well, that is all that need to be quoted from Mr. Crome's notes. Sir Matthew's son, also Matthew, succeeded to the title and estates, and so ends the first act of the Castringham tragedy. The new baronet did not occupy the room in which his father died, no. Indeed, was it slept in by anyone except an occasional visitor during the whole of his tenure. Nothing in particular marked the second Sir Matthew's reign, except the curiously constant rates at which he lost cattle and livestock dying, uh, I mean, which showed a tendency to increase slightly as time went on. The Castringham sickness. He put an end to it at last by a very simple expedient, by shutting up all his beasts in sheds at night and keeping no sheep in his park. For he had noticed that nothing was ever attacked that spent the night indoors. The second Sir Matthew died and was succeeded by his son, Sir Richard. It was in his time that the great family pew was built out on the north side of the parish church. The squire's plans were so grand, uh, several of the graves on that unhallowed side of the building had to be disturbed to satisfy his requirements. Among them was that of Mrs. Mother Soul. A certain amount of interest was excited in the village when it was known that the famous witch, who was still remembered by a few, was to be exhumed. And a feeling of surprise and disquiet was all the stronger when they found that though her coffin was fairly sound and unbroken, there was no trace whatever inside of body, bones, or dust. The incident revived for a time all the stories from 40 years ago about witch trials and about the exploits of the witches. Sir Richard's orders that the coffin should be burnt were thought by a good many to be rather foolhardy, but they were duly carried out. One morning, Sir Richard woke after a night of discomfort. It had been windy and his chimney had smoked persistently, and yet it was so cold that he needed to keep a fire going. Also, the window rattled so much that no man could have got any sleep. And here was the prospect of several notable guests arriving in the course of the day who would expect sport of some kind. The damage caused by the casting and sickness was a serious threat to his reputation as a huntsman. But what really touched him was simply the fact of having had a sleepless night. He certainly wouldn't be able to get any sleep in that room again. He must have a room with a western lookout so that the sun could not wake him early and it must be away from the business of the house. The housekeeper was at her wit's end. Well, Sir Richard, she said, 
you know that there's only one room like that in the house. Now, which may that be, said Sir Richard. Uh, that is Sir Matthew's west chamber. Well, put me in there. Well, that's where I'll sleep tonight, said her master. Oh, Sir Richard, but no one slept there for 40 years. The air has hardly been changed since Sir Matthew died there. Come, come, open the door, Mrs. Chuddock. I'll see the room at least. So it was opened. And indeed, the smell was very close and earthy. Sir Richard crossed to the window and impatiently, as he always did things, threw the shutters back and flung open the casement. For this end of the house was one which the alterations had barely touched. Grown up as it was, with the great ash tree, and otherwise concealed from view. Air it, Mrs. Tuddock, all today, and move my bed furniture in the afternoon. I'll put the Bishop of uh, Kilmore in my old room. Pray, Sir Richard, another voice said, might I have the favor of a moment's interview? Sir Richard turned round and saw a man in black in the doorway who bowed. I must ask your indulgence for this intrusion, Sir Richard. You will perhaps hardly remember me. My name is William Crome, and my grandfather was vicar here in your grandfather's time. Ah, oh, Mr. Crome, welcome. Might I offer you a glass of wine? And uh, you, Mrs. Chittick, as I said, be about airing this chamber. Yes, yes, it is here my grandfather died. Yes, the tree perhaps does make the place a little dampish. No, I do not wish to listen to any more. Make no difficulties, I beg. You have your orders. Go. Will you follow me, sir? The two men went into the study. Young Mr. Crome had brought with him a packet. It contained, among other things, the notes which the old vicar had made on the occasion of Sir Matthew Fell's death. And for the first time, Sir Richard was confronted with the mysterious instructions drawn by Crome's father from the Bible. <laughs> they amused him a good deal. Well, he said, my grandfather's Bible gave one prudent piece of advice. Cut it down. If that stands for the ash tree, he may rest assured I shall not neglect it. The tree's a nest of guitars and fevers. The parlour contained the family books. Sir Richard looked up from the paper to the bookcase. Crossing the room, he took out a dumpy Bible. It would be no bad plan to put it to the test again, Mr. Crome. I will wager we get a couple of names in the Chronicles, hmm? Now, what have we here? Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. Well, well, your grandfather would have made a fine omen of that, eh? Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. No more profits for me. They're all in a tale, Mr. Crome. In the afternoon came the guests, the Bishop of Kilmore, Lady Mary Harvey, Sir William Kentfield, etc., etc. Dinner at five, wine, cards, supper, and then the party dispersed to their rooms and wished Sir Richard a better night's sleep. And now we are in his bedroom with the light out and the squire in bed. The room is over the kitchen, and the night outside still and warm, so the window stays open. There's very little light about the bedstead, but there's a strange movement there. It seems as if Sir Richard is moving his head rapidly to and fro with only the slightest possible sound. Now, you would guess so deceptive as the half-darkness that he had several heads, round and brownish, which move backwards, forwards, as low as his chest. Is it a horrible illusion or 
More than that, there, something drops off the bed with a soft plump, like a kitten, and is out of the window in a flash. Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. As with Sir Matthew, so with Sir Richard. Dead and black in his bed. Pale and silent party of guests and servants gathered under the window when the news was known. Italian poisoners, popish emissaries, infected air, all these and more guesses were hazarded. The Bishop of Kilmore looked at the tree. In the fork of its lower boughs, a white tomcat was crouching, looking down the hollow which years had gnawed in the trunk. It was watching something inside the tree with great interest. Suddenly it got up and craned over the hole, then a bit of the edge on which it stood gave way, and it went slithering in. But few of us have heard, I hope, such a yell as came out of the trunk of the great ash. Lady Mary Harvey fainted outright, and the housekeeper stopped her ears and fled. The Bishop of Kilmore and Sir William Kenfield stayed. Yet even they felt some menace, though it was only the cry of a cat they heard, and Sir William swallowed once or twice before he could say, There's something more than we know of in that tree, my lord. I am for an instant search. And this was agreed upon. A ladder was brought, and one of the gardeners went up and, looking down the hollow, could detect nothing but a few dim indications of something moving. They got a lantern and let it down by rope. Up he went again. The others saw the yellow light on the gardener's face as he bent over. They saw his face struck with an incredulous terror and loathing before he cried out in a dreadful voice and fell back from the ladder. Well, happily, he was caught by two of the men, letting the lantern fall inside the tree. He was in a dead faint, and it was some time before any word could be got from him. But then, they had something else to look at. The lantern must have broken at the bottom, and the light in it caught upon dry leaves and rubbish that lay there, for in a few moments, a dense smoke began to come up, and then flame. And to be short, the tree was in a blaze. First, at the fork, they saw a round body covered with fire, the size of a man's head, appear very suddenly, then seem to collapse and fall back. This five or six times, and then a similar ball leapt into the air and fell on the grass, where after a moment it lay still. The bishop went as near as he dared to it and saw the remains of an enormous spider, all veined and seared, and as the fire burned lower down, more terrible bodies like this began to break out from the trunk. Spiders covered with greyish hair. All that day, the ash tree burned, and until it fell to pieces, the men stood about it and from time to time killed the brutes as they darted out. At last, there was a long interval when none appeared, and they cautiously closed in and examined the roots of the tree. 
They found, said the Bishop of Kilmore, below it, a rounded, hollow place in the earth. Inside were two or three bodies of these creatures that had been smothered by the smoke. And what is to me more curious, at the side of this den, against the wall, crouched the skeleton of a human being. The skin was dried upon the bones. There were some remains of black hair. Examination proved it to be the body of a woman. She'd been dead for the last 50 years.